Thank you all very much. And Linda, thanks very much for that introduction and for covering for me being a few minutes late. I am so sorry about that, but I've always found that people uh, tend to like my remarks better when their stomach is full. Uh, so uh, uh, hopefully that will help a little bit. And for those of you who know me, you know I come from four generations of very fast talking Texans. So I will, I will make up for starting a few minutes late by uh, getting in plenty of content uh, as well. Um, like I said, it is a real pleasure to be here with all of you. I, I'm going to talk about this a bit more as I get into my remarks, but one of the most remarkable things that's happening in a many remarkable, uh, some very uh, concerning things, but many remarkable things that are happening in our healthcare system is the much more active um, and uh, uh, meaningful role that, that patients and people who uh, live with patients uh, with cancer and other diseases are taking in helping to shape where our health policies and our healthcare system is going. I know it may not always feel that way when uh, you're faced with a new diagnosis or, or a high out-of-pocket costs or real frustrations in getting access to care, but the things that you all are doing are making more of a difference than ever before. And so I want to congratulate the cancer support community for not only uh, your ongoing involvement in making a difference in the lives of people with cancer and in our policies around cancer, uh, but also on this, this new survey that's being released today, which is a set of great questions for getting to patient-centered care. And now everybody's talking about that kind of term now, but you all are making, uh, demonstrating the difference between talk and action, the kinds of questions that uh, you all asked in the survey, and I know the, the, the details are coming out later, but I did get, uh, thanks to Kim and Linda, a preview of uh, uh, some of the, the, the really impressive findings. The kinds of things that you asked about include topics like coverage, and that's very important, uh, and uh, there are some real uh, and important gaps in coverage that need to be addressed, but also what it really means. You know, coverage is a means to an end. What really matters is, are patients getting access to the care that they need? Uh, are they getting clarity around their treatment options? And uh, the, do they have a, a plan in place that works for them, that meets their priorities? Uh, and what is going on with their outcomes? Uh, what's happening to their quality of life? Not just uh, is, the, is the cancer being uh, uh, controlled effectively in terms of tumor size or burden and the like, but, but what kind of lives are they leaving, leading? Is it longer? Uh, is it better? What kinds of activities can they perform? Or is it really reflecting uh, uh, what people want? And then increasingly important is the issue of the cost of, uh, of care as well. Um, as I'll talk about, we've seen a lot of progress in treatments for many different kinds of cancer. I think we're going to see a lot more in the next few years, and that's a good thing, uh, but it is creating some challenges around costs as well. By putting this all together, from a patient perspective, you are helping make sure that the policies in Washington focus on what really matters the most for patients. So I want to congratulate you for that. Now, I'm probably not going to be surprising anyone uh, and letting them know that while there's some really good things going on in cancer care today, I think you'll see this in your survey, there's some challenges as well. And some of the big challenges relate to, on the one hand, promoting uh, access to the best treatments that are available for each person with cancer today and making those treatments better in the future. We've got so much potential through understanding genomics and, and progress and uh, understanding the molecular mechanisms of cancer and knowing how to get to more uh, personalized treatments for cancer that are more effective, but at the same time dealing with the challenge of rising costs. And as I said, I think we're getting to the point where patients can and will be having uh, a much more important impact uh, in those trends. So what I'm going to do is spend a few minutes talking about one important area, one important example of an area where patient involvement is going to be increasingly important, and that's around some of the new models of care delivery for cancer patients that are starting to emerge and the payment systems that go along with them, which are quite different from uh, the old way that uh, oncologists and others involved in cancer care have gotten reimbursed. Um, but this is just one example of many issues where patient uh, and uh, community involvement really matters, and I'm happy to talk about uh, any things that you want to discuss. I, I talked to a couple of you beforehand. I think you got some good questions, so uh, be ready to fire away as soon as I get through this. Does that sound okay? All right, so uh, this is a, a slide, probably you've seen something like this before. This is taken from one of our recent papers on trends in approvals for 
new drugs uh, in the United States. Um, the, the main point that I wanted to make here is that uh, while there have been some ups and downs and while the 2013 numbers here are not quite complete, uh, the general trend has been towards more uh, development and more availability of some first-in-class or, or real addition-to-class treatments that are transforming care in many diseases. In the last few years, we've seen transformative treatments for patients with cystic fibrosis, patients with uh, hepatitis C, uh, and some of the most impressive examples are in cancer therapy. Uh, where uh, FDA has set up a, a new program for so-called breakthrough therapies. It was uh, part of a, um, a, a policy and legislative change that our group at Brookings helped to develop uh, for the 2012 FDA reform legislation. Uh, of the several dozen breakthrough uh, uh, drug designations that have been made, uh, a, a significant proportion of those have gone into cancer therapies, and you've seen uh, some of the benefits of, of, of those therapies uh, start to reach patients with uh, cancers like melanoma, blood cancers, uh, other cancers in recent years. There are many more treatments with breakthrough designations in development uh, for patients with cancer that have the, the promise of being much more effective because they're based on a better understanding of the, the uh, molecular pathway of the, uh, of the uh, cancer development. They're based on a better understanding of a patient's uh, and the tumor's genomics that can uh, help choose, uh, help uh, uh, pr uh, providers identify the right combination uh, of treatments for, for patients. Uh, and there are a lot more of these in the works as uh, cancer therapy is moving away from, you know, focusing on breast or lung or specific, uh, uh, um, you know, clinical areas and more towards the underlying mechanism of the cancer itself in each individual patient. We're getting better at understanding that and I think the potential for the future uh, in the years ahead is really good. There's some real challenges around developing these more personalized therapies and we can come back and talk about those as well. Uh, but, you know, big picture, uh, I know, it, I, and I, I would like it to be uh, moving along faster, but I think there's a lot of promise uh, in some of the treatments that are coming online and that are likely to come online uh, for patients in the next few years. The challenge, of course, with all of this is that uh, these treatments are, are generally not cheap, and we could have a, also a long conversation uh, that, that would be uh, very interesting, very timely about what's going on with, uh, with pricing and the, and the overall cost of uh, some of these new therapies and combination therapies uh, for cancer. Uh, but uh, what we've seen on the one hand is that there have been significant improvements in outcomes for cancer patients for breast, lung, you know, just, just about all of the major uh, air, uh, common areas of, uh, of cancer. Uh, and that's been worth a lot in terms of people being able to live longer lives and, and, uh, uh, and uh, better lives at, at the same time. But it's also come at a rising cost. So the cost of uh, total spending on cancer is projected to double uh, in the United States over uh, the next decade. And that's a big contributor to this chart, which is what's going on with what the, the federal government spends on everything. Uh, you don't need to look at all the, the numbers here, but uh, if you think about uh, federal government spending money on three main things, just three, uh, the dark blue part of this, and this is over time from like the 1970s projected out for the next uh, uh, 20 years, according to some of the latest projections from the Congressional Budget Office, um, the three main things that the federal government spends money on, one is Social Security, that's the dark blue part of this chart. And you can see that that's going up as a share of our nation's GDP, our share of our nation's total output from you know, around 4% uh, or so 20 years ago to up to 5% or so as the, as the baby boom retires. That's you know, demographics, more, more baby boomers living longer, thanks in part to better cancer therapies. Um, the second component, the red, is the health care spending. So that's Medicare, Medicaid, the new subsidies for people under the Affordable Care Act Health Insurance Exchange, Children's Health Insurance Program. And then the light blue is everything else that the federal government spends money on. You can see there's that big peak in the middle. That was the Great Recession. So anytime there's a big economic turn down, federal government spends more. That's like stimulus spending, unemployment, things like that. So we're on the downward curve from that. Uh, and, and, and those other bumps in previous years in, in the top are also uh, coincide with uh, recessions largely. But the, the, the big trend that I wanted to, to emphasize here is that over the past 40 years, and even with some of the slowdowns in 
healthcare spending growth that have occurred in the last few years, the steady pattern uh, over this whole chart is more and more spending on the healthcare programs. And that's partly due to demographics, but it's also partly due to the fact that there are more technologies that do more to help people live longer lives, and those technologies are worth a lot. Uh, so healthcare costs rising has been the big story for the federal deficits that have been emer emerging. Uh, it's been the big story for uh, a lot of the squeezes. You know, the light blue area has gotten smaller, so that's everything else that the federal government spends money on besides medical care and social security. So low-income assistance programs, education programs, infrastructure programs, even R&D, all those programs are getting squeezed, and it's kind of built into law now with the so-called sequester. Uh, so uh, we, we are getting more for the health care spending, but it's a real challenge at the federal level. That's the federal chart. It could do the same thing for, for state governments. The only uh, major item in state budgets that's been increasing has been Medicaid uh, spending, everything else, K-12 education, early childhood education. Those have been getting shrunk down. Uh, and you could do a similar kind of chart for family budgets, for, for you uh, and for those of you who have been living with cancer or have family members uh, who have uh, the spending out of pocket on health care has been going up. And that's despite some of the very important efforts around increasing access to coverage that uh, have been enacted with the ACA and that uh, are continue to be uh, debated as we go forward. So this is, I think, at the heart of some of the real challenges in, in access uh, and uh, quality of care and cost of care that uh, are a part of uh, or sort of the key elements of that survey that's about this. Uh, that's what I'd really like to talk about to, to, with you for the, the rest of our time together today. And I'd like to talk about one direction for doing something about this, I think, is Hold, that holds a lot of promise. Um, I'll tell you about some things I think are potentially challenging. Uh, uh, typically, when um, costs go up in a federal program like Medicare, uh, the typical response is to squeeze down on the, the payments to, to the doctors. You know, you guys have probably heard of the so-called SGR debate that Congress is you know, working right now to try to fix. So if uh, spending goes up more than it seems like we can afford, if that red area is getting bigger, well, let's cut, cut the payment rates. Uh, same thing is true for hospitals and other providers have been built in to some of the, uh, the, the recent health care laws and also some of the recent laws designed to try to address the, the budget deficit and, and, the, and the sequester. Uh, the problem with that approach is uh, while we're definitely spending money in some ways in the, in the wrong ways and while uh, some uh, services that Medicare pays for unquestionably are, are being paid at inappropriately high rates, if you keep squeezing down the rates, it does create problems with quality and access. Uh, you all have uh, been working in this area enough to know that uh, oncologists today are feeling like uh, the, the rates, especially that they get to sp uh, get paid to spend time with patients, or like developing a care plan or, uh, or, or, or the like, uh, are just very low. And so it makes it difficult for, for providers to make ends meet in their practice while still doing uh, what they'd like to do for their patients. Uh, the other kind of thing that, that's a way to keep costs down is to just limit access to, to new treatments. And, you know, there again, there are a lot of examples of treatments being used inappropriately but uh, uh, big uh, across-the-board restrictions and access are just not necessarily a, a good fit, and that's going to be an increasingly bad fit as care gets more and more personalized, right? That's where we're headed in cancer care, where the right combination of treatments for each individual patient really matters on the genomics, the, the preferences, the history of that individual patient. And that's really hard to fit into prior auth rules and coverage restrictions that uh, a public plan or a, a private insurance plan might come up with. So I want to talk about a different way of trying to address those same concerns. Again, here's the, here, what we want is in a continued innovation in cancer care that's really high value, that helps people get what they really want to improve their quality of life, uh, improve access to, to needed treatments for them, address the kinds of challenges that are, that are in your survey. And if you think about where innovation comes from. Uh, one part is more effective treatments. So uh, there are a lot of cancers out there that despite all the progress in recent years uh, still don't have effective, uh, let alone curative, therapies. And more of those are going to come along and they do have significant costs associated with them. At the same time, there are a lot of things that, that, that could happen in health care, including in cancer care, that might be able to, to bring costs down. Uh, these include things like uh, 
using better diagnostic testing. So there's a lot of work going on now uh, to try to use uh, uh, so-called SNPs or even full genome sequencing to identify specific uh, genetic features of a tumor uh, or of a, of, of a cancer patient that would tell you much more confidently whether a patient's going to respond or not. And we know about, we've got some examples of this already in, uh, in uh, uh, breast cancer and herceptin treatment based on uh, estrogen receptor status. But uh, as you all know, there's, there's a lot more uh, genetic variants within different kinds of cancers that do affect which uh, drugs or combinations of drugs are going to be most effective. We know today that even for truly effective treatments, you know, some of these breakthrough treatments, um, uh, breakthrough treatment is one where, you know, 25, 30 the percent of the patients respond significantly. Well, with much more targeted therapies, you could get up to 80, 90 percent. You could really focus in on using these costly new treatments and combinations of treatments in the patients that, uh, that would benefit from it. Uh, so there's some, uh, a lot of uh, innovations going on in diagnostics and targeting cancer therapy. Uh, that, that could help bring costs down while you know, still creating value for patients. Second big area is around uh, more personalized health care. So in other areas of our economy, uh, everything now is going wireless, the Internet of Things, remote monitoring, stuff that you used to have to go to the, the store to do or uh, uh, go to the mall to do, you can now do from home. Healthcare is moving in that direction a bit, but, uh, but it seems like there's a lot more potential for uh, remote monitoring from home. Uh, there's some really good ideas that we've seen in some cancer practices around the country where uh, uh, the oncologists are setting up uh, email access systems and, and remote automatic monitoring systems for their patients so that if there is a problem, you know, a new fever, uh, a problem with hydration or weight loss, uh, they can hear about that automatically earlier without the patient have it, having to come in. Uh, and then can provide more support over the phone online, maybe send a nurse out to the, uh, out to the house. That's a lot cheaper than, and easier than a patient coming into an emergency room to get treatment after hours or something like that. Uh, similarly, new uh, team-based approaches to care. Uh, there are a number of oncology practices that are uh, not just focusing on an oncologist primarily delivering care, but working more with nurse practitioners, social workers, pharmacists, other people who have the skill set and, and maybe are better able to provide certain kinds of services to particular patients uh, other than, you know, through a traditional kind of uh, office visit or, uh, or hospital visit or something like that, cheaper and more convenient, better targeted of the patient. Uh, and then other steps, you know, outside of uh, traditional health care, uh, nutritional steps, behavioral changes uh, that can have an impact uh, on uh, treatment or, or outcomes for patients with cancer, as you know, also can be very important in preventing cancers in the first place, which could in turn have a big uh, impact on, on health care costs. The problem is that in a lot of our traditional ways of paying for health care, the way that the doctors and the hospitals get reimbursed in programs like Medicare, um, we, we've got mechanisms for paying for the drugs in most cases. You know, we, there's still a lot of this pressure to squeeze down the prices uh, for, for the drugs, for the doctors, for the hospitals, maybe rich restrict access a bit. But a lot of those other things I just talked about, those aren't covered very well at all. In fact, in um, some of the work that we've been doing around trying to support improvements in uh, oncology practice. We've worked with groups like, I think, uh, I think you all have here as well, with people like John Sprandio from, uh, uh, from Philadelphia, who's had this idea of setting up, you know, extending a concept that, that works in primary care and works in, in, seems to work in cancer care as well, the notion of a medical home uh, for, for cancer patients. Uh, I think still the terminology is not great, medical home, you know, I think not everybody knows what that really means. Sounds a little uh, uh, scary. I don't want to be home in a medical office or something. But, but the concept is much more patient-centered care, right? So uh, the, the ideas behind uh, a medical home and primary care, similar to an oncology care, are things like uh, having a doctor or a member of the staff who will answer your email or respond to your text uh, or who will be there uh, after hours. So if you call at 5.30 because you've got a new fever uh, or uh, a new kind of pain, uh, you won't get the message that, you know, this is so-and-so's so answering service. If this is a medical emergency, please hang up and call 911. Uh, and if it's an urgent problem, you may as well go to the emergency room as well. Instead, uh, these offices are keeping 
office hours open longer. Uh, they're extending their time for uh, staffing a, a kind of an acute care center capability. So if it's just a matter of getting an antibiotic or getting infused with fluids, you know, you can do it much more conveniently in the office than by, you know, having to go uh, to, to the emergency room and wait and probably be exposed to new kinds of bugs and, uh, and, and things like that. Uh, they're trying to spend more time on uh, coming up with uh, uh, care plans that the, that the patient and their, their family and caregivers would be involved with. So uh, uh, sitting down and spending a good half hour, an hour, it may not be all the doctor's time, it may be a, you know, maybe a social worker or a nurse who, who uh, is, is very experienced in, in working with patients uh, to, to do that. Uh, the problem is that all these kinds of things I'm talking about, they, just don't, they don't get paid for under traditional payment systems. And to the extent we try to control costs by squeezing down the payments for like an office visit, uh, uh, you know, there, there's really not a, a Medicare like uh, phone, you know, uh, phone call uh, uh, payment or anything like that. So the extent we keep squeezing these things down, it gets harder and harder for doctors like John Sprandio, oncologists who want to do the right thing for their patients and deliver patient-centered care to actually be able to do it. You know, they can try to do these things, but they lose lose money on it. It's one of the, some of the most interesting and challenging meetings I had when I was CMS administrator would be um, physicians or, or um, uh, CEOs of physician group practices who come in and go through lists of things like this that they were doing for their patients. Team-based approaches of care, using wireless technologies, using uh, remote monitoring, uh, setting up alternatives to going to the emergency room, uh, uh, cost-saving ways of heading off complications, saying, look, we're getting better outcomes for our patients, we're reducing costs overall, but we can't do it. We can't sustain uh, these models because, you know, Medicare is saving the money, but we're getting paid less. All these things I've just been talking about result in lower reimbursement for our practice, even though they're cost saving and outcome improving uh, for patients. So that's why there's a lot of interest now in alternative payment models in healthcare in general and in payments for cancer care in particular. And I want to go through several examples. Uh, don't worry if you can't read the slides. I'll make sure that we, we get those to you uh, uh, afterwards. But uh, some of the most popular models that I'm sure some of you are familiar with are uh, what you might call clinical pathway models, which is, uh, look, uh, if we... Um, know uh, from clinical evidence, uh, guidelines or clinical studies or other sources that certain ways of treating a cancer work better, um, certain types of chemotherapy use, some of these kinds of uh, interventions, you know, more support uh, care type interventions I've described, uh, we should pay more for that. So this is kind of a, a typical, uh, now fairly common approach that many health insurers, uh, uh, many private plans, uh, some uh, uh, Medicare Advantage plans, uh, and uh, uh, some pilots in the Medicare program uh, are trying out right now. So if, uh, uh, if a patient gets uh, evidence-based uh, therapy and kind of the right uh, evidence-based uh, uh, chemotherapy choices and management, uh, they get an additional payment. And I think that's, that's a good place to start. Uh, it helps uh, provide more support for oncologists for kind of doing uh, uh, the latest thing according to the evidence. Uh, under the existing oncology payment mechanisms, as you all know, a lot of payments are tied up in uh, chemotherapy. So it's the, the chemotherapy itself and the chemo admin fee, that, that four and a half to six percent that gets added on that makes for a lot of the practice revenues for, for an oncology practice. And again, this is not about you know, oncologists just trying to make money. I mean, they're just trying to make ends meet uh, in, in doing the right thing uh, for their patients. This enables them to get more revenues that are tied to delivering uh, the kind of the right evidence-based uh, uh, choices of, of chemotherapy. And I think those are, those are important steps. But they really don't get at all of the kinds of issues that I was just describing. Uh, much more important in that direction are things like uh, the patient-centered medical home extended to oncology. So uh, in that model that uh, John Sprandio and others have now tried in cancer care, uh, what they're doing, instead of just relying on those traditional fee-for-service payments for care, which are tied to the volume of chemotherapy and the intensity of chemotherapy and not necessarily to the things that really matter to patients, uh, they're getting a new so-called per member per month payment, uh, uh, a fixed payment that's an add-on uh, to the usual traditional way of paying for care in conjunction with 
implementing some of the steps that I've just described, like having extended office hours and having, uh, you know, demonstrating that they're actually uh, setting up uh, uh, cancer care plans with their patients uh, and uh, taking steps to uh, be more uh, available, be more of a, of a medical home uh, for the patient. Uh, this is something that's been tried in the, the in private insurance plans, and just a few weeks ago, Medicare announced a, a major pilot program through its Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation that's very much along these lines. It's a $160 payment per month uh, for patients who are undergoing active therapy for their cancer, as reflected in uh, in uh, in uh, some kind of chemotherapy. So it's not a perfect match uh, to you know what's really active therapy, but it's a, a big uh, change from where Medicare had been. And in, if uh, the practice takes steps like having extended office hours, having the ability to uh, help patients head off complications that could cause them to end up in the emergency room and, and the like, they get this additional payment. Uh, and this is something that is starting to be tried in a number of health plans, as I said, not just private plans, but, uh, uh, but Medicare uh, as well. Um, there's a further step beyond this called uh, uh, accountable care organizations. Are you guys familiar with the, the terms? Okay, so I, I want to, I'm just trying to pitch this the right way, but you can think of this as, you know, we're, we're moving away from the fee-for-service payment track. So one way to do that is through an add-on payment, like the, the medical home, the oncology medical home payment I just described. And then another way to do that, which are, these, these can be done together, they're, they're not mutually exclusive, uh, is to start having a second track of payment that's tied to what's really going on at the, at the person level with their care. Uh, and by what's really going on, I mean what's going on with their overall costs, not just their costs in the, uh, in the oncology practice, but the overall cost of their care, including hospital costs and uh, costs for complications and, and everything else, uh, and also measures of their quality of care. And the basic notion behind ACOs in general is instead of just having fee-for-service payment systems, we're going to have a second track where uh, Medicare, the private insurer, keeps track of the overall cost for the patient. Uh, and uh, measures of the overall quality of care uh, for, for this population of patients. And the deal is, is the practice can show that the patients are getting better results and lower overall cost at the same time, then they get additional payments. And these payments are not tied to, to doing more chemotherapy or ordering more tests or doing more MRIs. They're tied to the patients actually having better uh, quality care and lower overall cost. So that's designed to provide a stronger incentive, something that health plans have been more willing to get behind because it's, you know, it's kind of making the, the providers uh, more accountable. So you're, you're count, you know, traditionally you're accountable for the, the tests that you do and the, uh, and the images that you order and the chemo that you administer and so forth. Under these models, that there really is some accountability for the practice to you know, make care better at the, at the level of an overall patient, to make it more, you know, better patient-centered results. And this is something that, that's challenging for physicians to take on, since a lot of the stuff that influences cancer patients' outcomes or any patient's outcome is beyond the control of the doctor. Uh, these are typically being implemented in a stepwise way, so they might start only with a, an opportunity for a bonus. You can get shared savings if costs turn out to be lower, but you don't pay, you don't, you don't have a financial penalty, you, the, the oncologist, don't have a financial penalty if costs end up being higher. But some of the practices that have gone in this direction in ACOs, uh, and one reason that I think these, these programs are, are, are growing so much, is that they, f they find that it gives them a lot more ability to redirect the resources to what really matters for patients. So instead of having to, you know, get revenues for your practice by ordering more lab tests and things like that, the further you move away from fee-for-service, the more that your payments are at the per person level and depending on outcomes, the more that you can spend money on things like adopting a team-based approach to care or answering a patient's emails uh, or having extended office hours or setting up alternatives to the patient's going to the emergency room. Um, under these models, you have to be saving money while you're doing that and that's hard and that's why these are, these are not easy uh, programs to adopt. You have to be improving quality of care at the same time, also hard, uh, but together it's a different way of paying for care. I think we're increasingly seeing shifts uh, in that direction. 
Um, just an example of this uh, from uh, Florida, the Moffitt Cancer Center has um, taken this ACO concept and applied it to uh, oncology practices in particular. Um, some other models along these lines, uh, United Healthcare, you all may have heard about their um, bundle payment initiative where they took some of the payments that um, uh, oncologists were typically getting for administering chemotherapy. They added up what a, a typical oncologist got in a month uh, for all the chemotherapy administration. They converted it to a, a flat payment amount, a PMPM. Uh, you know, again, this, uh, this shift away from fee-for-service where the oncology practice was potentially, it uh, had, had a new potential opportunity for savings if they reduced uh, spending overall uh, and got to improved outcomes for their patients. Uh, these models are showing some promising early results. Um, I think when United implemented this plan, they thought that the main way that the savings would occur would be in changes in the choice of chemotherapy because, you know, when you set up a payment this way, you don't, if you're an oncologist, you no longer have to give more and more intensive chemo in order to get more revenues for your practice. You know, that, you, you still get paid for, still get reimbursed for doing the, the for providing the chemo, but, but you don't get the, the you know, the, this um, volume-based practice fee on top of it just to fix them out. Interestingly, it turned out that some of the biggest savings were in lower rates of use of emergency departments and lower hospital admissions for things like, um, you know, after hours, care needs, or dehydration or uh, measurement, uh, ma uh, management of fever and neutropenia, which it, you know, turns out you can actually do pretty well if you have like a good care team, uh, you can do pretty well outside of the hospital and avoid the hospital in the first place. And what the dollars really ended up, the shift in the dollars really ended up allowing the practices to do was spending more time with their patients on care plans, more time responding to uh, needs of their patients that might otherwise have had them end up in the, in the emergency room. Uh, so that's where it seems like there are, there are a lot of, now they had a cost reductions of 34%. Um, I, you know, I haven't seen that replicated everywhere, and this is just one pilot. Uh, but if you go back to that chart that I showed you at the beginning, if we can reduce spending growth uh, by, you know, just a couple of percent per year, so just 2% changes, uh, incremental changes in the way that cancer patients are being treated that, that makes them better, that's more patient-centered care, uh, and that costs less at the same time because you're having fewer costly complications, fewer unnecessary services, that would offset uh, the, these um, rising costs due to demographics, due to uh, new and more costly treatments being available that, that are enabling people to live longer uh, and better lives. So it's a potentially very effective way uh, of keeping not only keeping care affordable, uh, that's very important, uh, but making sure that we're spending the dollars in healthcare on stuff that really matters to patients, not just the, you know, treating patients more intensively, not just dealing with the complications, but making sure people get the right treatment uh, and heading off those complications and getting to better quality of life at the same time. Now, we are still very much in the middle of this journey uh, towards uh, uh, better uh, uh, payments and, and uh, um, or towards different payment systems and ways of improving care. I want to emphasize that, that, that better care is not going to be achieved only through changes in the way that uh, providers are paid. Uh, also very important, most important in all of this is the professionalism and the desire of uh, people who are providing cancer care today, the doctors, the nurses, all the clinicians involved. The main reason they're there is because they want to make people's lives better. That's why they went to school for so long. That's why they worked so hard. That's why they put up with all this, you know, administrative bureaucracy from the government and the, and the health plans to, to deliver care. Uh, but the main point of these payment reforms is that they can reinforce that professionalism. You know, a lot of the people that we talk to are in these kind of uh, oncology medical home models. People like John Spranio says, you know, it, it's great that we're improving outcomes and getting costs down. That's really important. Uh, but what's also important is that the doctors and nurses practicing in our organization are happier with what they're doing because they're getting to spend their time uh, more on what really matters for patients. We're aligning payments much better with what professionalism says is the right thing to do for a patient. It's, you know, getting them a care plan and getting them the right chemotherapy, not necessarily just shoveling, shuffling them through the office as quickly as possible as they can get to another fee-for-service visit. Uh, also very important for better care is choice and competition, patients being more informed uh, about the, their treatment options and their outcomes, uh, and uh, that gets to quality measures being a very important part of all of this. Another area where I've seen a lot of leadership from patient organizations um, 
in other areas, and I think it's coming to cancer as well, is in driving what should be the main focus of care and, and how we can practically measure it uh, in the real world. And I think the main way to practically measure it in the real world in areas like cancer is frankly going to be things like the survey that you've done. Uh, in every other area of our economy, uh, crowdsource information, social networks are transforming uh, the way that people make choices about where, where they go to eat, uh, what they do, uh, what they buy. Uh, in healthcare, we haven't really figured out, it's starting to happen, but we haven't really figured out good systematic ways to, 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 to incorporate that in clinical trials that are underway. You know, why don't we have more uh, patient reported outcomes? It's not because it's, it's, it's not, I mean, it's cheap to do now. Uh, anybody who's got uh, uh, a Yelp app uh, knows that. Uh, but we haven't incorporated it into clinical research well. We haven't incorporated it into our payment systems uh, well. We haven't incorporated, incorporated it into our public reporting systems well. There are challenges there. You want to make sure that you're accounting for for uh, things like differences in patient severity and so forth, but these are manageable challenges and uh, greater emphasis on, on better performance measures driven by uh, what matters most to patients, that is what you're doing, uh, can really be a powerful way of making these payment reforms more powerful and giving patients uh, more of an ability, more insight into getting the best care. Uh, also uh, important uh, is patient engagement. If you uh, shop for, if you're uh, on the, an, uh, an ACA exchange today uh, and you, you get a plan, you're probably going to be looking at a pretty significant de deductible and then probably a lot of restrictions on, on the drugs that are covered. Some of the interesting things that are going on in insurance benefit design that I'd like to see be much more widespread are making insurance coverage be much more about value than about volume and intensity as well. So, you know, I've been talking about what's going on with provider payment. But the same thing goes for patients. You know, if you're able to find uh, a medical home practice that can get you the care that you need at a lower cost, you should pay significantly less for that. And there's some uh, insurance plans that are now being designed using so-called value-based insurance design where um, if, uh, if you go to really uh, cost-effective providers, ones that are getting good outcomes, at lower cost, you, the patient, get to share in the savings in the form of lower premiums and lower copays. If you're using uh, very effective drugs for your conditions, that doesn't make it on tier four or tier five. That's down to tier one uh, or tier two. So there's still more work to do here, but can all reinforce uh, this shift towards a focus on value uh, rather than volume. That is what I've been trying to highlight with the payment reforms I've described. Uh, and then very important here as well is um, things like risk adjustment and other steps to make sure that uh, the providers that are attracting and keeping the most complex and difficult patients uh, get recognized appropriately for that. Uh, there are good ways to do this too. Again, I think patient reported information uh, can help, but accounting for the severity of uh, illness of a patient, accounting for the fact that sometimes you just have, uh, you just have bad luck, uh, very costly complications, and it is completely beyond the fault of the providers. We're still working out how to incorporate those effectively into reform payment systems. Again, an area where I think uh, more progress is going to happen and, and you all can play an important role. So um, I've uh, actually talked a little bit longer than I thought I would. I hopefully kept up my usual uh, Texas pace, uh, but I did want to just end by, by coming back to the basic point here, which is uh, we are moving towards an era, we're going to get there, of much more personalized cancer care where uh, each individual individuals' characteristics, their genomics, how they want to get their care, what their goals and quality of life are, that, those are going to be uh, increasingly built into the way that cancer care is delivered. Uh, why do I say that? Because this is, th these things matter more to you and your loved ones than, than just about anything else, and we're going to find ways to get there. The only question is how hard is it going to be and how long is it going to take? And the kinds of steps that I've described today around payment reform, I think are one element of getting there. Probably the most important element of getting there is all of you, uh, continuing to be very active and, and very clear about what you want in your cancer care and what's not happening today, what that gap is, and then going further than that and trying to engage constructively in finding ways that, that policymakers and that people out in the community, uh, healthcare professionals, can help close those gaps. Uh, that's, what, uh, uh, that's what your network is all about. That's what the cancer support community is doing around the country today, and I want to commend you for it and thank you for the opportunity to be here with you uh, at your conference today and at the release of this very important survey. Thank you all very much.
There's a lot there. Have you seen the film also that they showed? I, I saw some excerpts and, and I've seen the, I got to see an advanced copy of the report. There's a, there's a lot, you're, you're right, there's a lot there in terms of uh, no. patient experience with, uh, with cancer care. No, there's a lot there and there's a lot um, in your remarks too. So, um, you know, I've, I've been at this work um, as a cancer survivor and uh, I'm what people refer to now as a seasoned patient <laughs> advocate. So, um, and I also, just in the fall, turned 65. And I also um, relapsed and had mm. to have surgery again mm. uh, after 10 years of peace and quiet. Mm. Um, so I've had a lot to try to think about and I, I wanna try to focus in just on um, my Medicare experience. Um, and um, in the film, Dr. Sprandio and um, Dr. Emanuel touched on this and you touched yeah. on it too. Um, you know, to me, it seems like um, there's a huge amount of cynicism um, that's directed at um, the, the motivation of clinicians in cancer care. And that's uh, profoundly discouraging from uh, the perspective, and um, the, some of the patients in that film actually touched on this without actually using that word, but you know, I wanna call that word out, because the, the idea that um, patients should not be allowed to trust the recommendations of their clinicians, um, and um, that therefore it's okay to shift more and more out-of-pocket costs onto patients in order to stimulate them to dig more and maybe ask more questions uh, is is really really terrible situation to put yeah. people with cancer in. Yeah. And um, do you have any thoughts about how that um, can be yeah. uh, addressed? Because um, most of the time, I think oncologists and probably even most doctors want to try to do right by their patients. Yeah. Um, they exist and practice in a world that faces them with uh, terrible ethical challenges on a daily basis. Um, and it would be great if there were a way to try to navigate through this and tone down some of the um, political rancor around this and focus on you know, a healing relationship, which yeah. is actually very important for people dealing yeah. with cancer. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a great um, question and, and framing, John, for kind of where we are in, uh, you know, it, I think cancer is kind of the leading edge of this just because the, you know, the illnesses involved are so serious and the, the costs involved are, are so high, but this is, I think, mean, pretty representative uh, indicator of just what the challenges are in our healthcare systems today. And one of the things that I'd really like to emphasize is that while, you know, there, there's some cynicism on the part of, you know, healthcare experts out there and, and you know, even some, uh, even some patients, um, I think that the vast majority of patient experience in this country, and I think this is going to be borne out in your survey too, is that um, they, they really like their clinician, uh, they trust their clinician, they believe, and I think in most, the vast majority of cases correctly, their clinician is trying to do the right thing for them. Uh, and yet we still have this very high level of cynicism because if you look at you know, some of the actual statistics on where the money's going and how care is being delivered, there are some really important gaps there. You know, there are a lot of cases of uh, patients not getting uh, the, the right chemotherapy, but as I've pointed out and some of the evidence that we've seen, you know, the best, the biggest opportunities for savings isn't around, you know, sort of wrong chemotherapy and doctors, you know, trying to do more uh, 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 intensive services like that, but it's, it's, it's preventable complications. Um, it's it's, it's the, the emergency room use and the hospitalizations, they vary a lot across practices and in the, um, in the in these new models like the the Sprandio model, there's a guy who's not cynical about the future. Um, he really has identified some ways to prevent uh, patients from going into the hospital to make sure patients are really getting the treatment that they want, you know, that, that, that meets their needs, given all the the, the risks and benefit of uh, of alternative options available. And I think I think the, the the other part of cynicism that doesn't get recognized a lot is the cynicism on the part of the 
providers because they really do feel like um, they're being asked to do uh, lots of administrative steps, lots of prior authorization for treatments, uh, and they want to spend more time with their patients, they want to do the right thing, but they just don't get paid for it. So, so to me, it's, it's not an issue of lack of professionalism, it's just the opposite. I mean, professionalism is at the top of the list uh, of what policy reforms need to support, because that's the biggest thing that we and patients have, have going for us in our, uh, in our healthcare system, uh, it's that we just don't do a good job of supporting. It's math. It's, it's, you, know, you can't do what you'd like to do for your patients as a physician today and still make ends meet in your practice. Um, and that's, that's not going to be an easy problem to solve because uh, there, there is so much, uh, there are so many costs and, and, and costs are rising as I, as I described before, but there are definitely some things that we can do to create more alignment between what your professional view, you as an oncologist, you as a physician, your professional view says is the right thing to do for my patients and, and what you get paid for. That's the source of, of frustration and cynicism in medicine. It's like, you know, here's the things that you know you should be doing, here's the things that you get paid for, and that lack of overlap is just really creating a lot of cynicism. What some of these, re these, these reforms that I've been talking about, they don't solve that problem, they do try really hard to take steps to address it. It's like, okay, if you're not getting paid for what really matters for your patient. Let's give you more money so that you can do what matters for your patient uh, and let's focus on improving those outcomes and making sure that there is a better alignment between what you and other patients are, are saying needs to be done and, and the way that clinicians are getting paid. That's what the right kind of payment reform should be about. It's not because oncologists are trying to do the wrong thing or trying to waste money or trying to, uh, uh, to, to, to you know, uh, pad their incomes. It's because they can't do the right thing and still make ends meet in their practice under the way that we're paying them today. To the patients, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I don't think it's, I, I don't think that's the ultimate solution because, you know, that's, I mean, you, you'll, I think, see it in your survey, that's not what patients want. Uh, I think there are better ways to get overall costs down than just shifting costs in terms of, you know, very high deductibles, putting all the cancer drugs, uh, all the, the biologics on tier five. I think there, there are better ways to do it than that. That said, um, there is still a lot of unnecessary spending in, in cancer care and healthcare more generally. But for patients, uh, what I would like to see more of is uh, if you uh, go to a practice that, that's taking on, you know, that's really trying to take on these challenges and deliver care more efficiently and appropriately, like uh, people like John Sprandio are doing. If you go to those practices that do cost less, and we're seeing evidence that they do, and that's why these measures of, of what's really going on in cancer care uh, are important. If you go to those practices, you should pay less out of pocket. If you use the most effective uh, therapies for your condition, you should pay less out of pocket, not more. It's, it's again, it's the, the same thing on the patient side uh, that we've run into on the provider side. If we are just focused on volume, if we just have payment systems that are about volume and intensity of services, uh, then you know that's that's what you get. What we should have is is payment systems that are more about getting the best care for a patient. And there's starting to be some systems, some insurance options that, that recognize this and that pass those savings along uh, to, to uh, cancer patients. Uh, by, by no means have we solved this issue, but John, absolutely, I mean, that, that, is, that is why it's so important for um, groups like this one to highlight that, that we are not there yet in terms of quality of care and cost of care, and that should drive the, that, that should be what drives our policy reforms, not this belief that there's a, you know, a whole bunch of, not, not cynicism, there are a whole bunch of bad doctors out there that are just trying to make money, and, and a whole bunch of patients that, that, you know, don't know what they want and, and need to be punished by having to pay more. Wrong way. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Dr. McClellan for being with us today. Thank you all very much. Enjoy the afternoon.